talking about uh, a, a full assurance of faith. Our scripture uh, is kind of divided into two sections this morning, and I wanted to start with the, the bottom section first. Uh, when it talks about, therefore, brethren, we want you to have boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's a reflection of, in the Old Testament, uh, once a year, the high priest would enter into the holiest of holies. Uh, and we know from uh, a Jewish tradition that only the high priest can enter that most holy part of the tabernacle. And uh, tradition also holds that since the high priest was the only one who can legally enter in, when they did, they had a rope tied to one of their feet so that if the uh, priest passed out or passed away, uh, no one else could go into there. So they would pull them out uh, with that rope. And I always, whenever I, I looked at that, I said, man, you have to have a full assurance of faith to be able to have that kind of confidence to walk into the holiest of holy and, and know that uh, only one person in the whole world can enter that, per that part of the tabernacle and you were it. So you need to make sure, because uh, if anyone entered into the holiest of holies unworthily, uh, bad things can happen to them. But God is trying to teach us today, we want to have that type of boldness that you, you and you can enter into the holiest parts of the house of God uh, with, with us full assurance of faith. But the thing that he me wanted to help us to understand that, yes, a few things had to change. And that goes back to the early parts of our uh, scripture today in Hebrews chapter 10. Because our text starts off in verse 11 saying, every priest stands ministering every single day offering over and over and over again the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. And I wanted us to stop there for a second, uh, saints of God, because how many times have we found ourselves stuck in religious rituals, religious practices, doing things that was handed to us, and now we're doing them, day after day, day after day, time after time. But even the Bible says many of these things that we call sacrifices don't even do anything for our hearts and our minds and the sins that we are trying to overcome and be victorious over. But yet, not only the people, but the priest were offering these sacrifices. And we understand from our reading of scripture that those sacrifices were the oxen and the doves and, and the lambs. And can you imagine if one day they, those oxen and lambs and doves were able to talk and, and speak to the priest and saying, dude, how many of us gotta die and it's not even making a difference. How many sacrifices in the year 2021 are you making? Have you made? How many sacrifices in the year 2022 will you make? Will you offer which don't even make a difference in your heart? They're just rituals that you're doing day after day. That's the difference between the religion of old and the religion that even the devil himself don't care if you get involved in. Just religious practices that don't, don't even make a difference about the sin that we are dealing with. But I love that verse 12 when it says, but this man, 
you know, when, when you get, uh, get stuck in a rut, if you ever get stuck in a rut, you need to just say that, but this man, sometimes we'll say, but God, this man has offered one sacrifice that makes a difference in our heart. And this person is just now sitting down by the right hand of God. And he has, by this one offering, verse 14 says, has perfected us who are being sanctified. God is setting us apart and making us perfect day by day. It's a day by day struggle. It's a day by day effort. But the sacrifices that he made is causing an impact in your heart, which will in turn cause an impact in your life. And this is what I love. It says in verse, starting at verse 16, this is the words of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but we also know that these words are found in Jeremiah chapter 31 where God says, this is this new covenant that I'm going to make with you. I know in the past, I wrote all these laws and stone tablets. You have to go read these stone tablets, memorize them, and try to put them into practice as you understood them and as you interpreted them. And that's why even today in churches, you have one Bible but a whole bunch of interpretations. And he says, I understand that that wasn't working. You need to understand that is not working. The system of sacrifice is over and over again. It's not working. So this is the new covenant that I will make with you, my people. I will put my laws in your heart. And in your mind, so that the heart and the mind are going to be directed by God, so that you won't be just lost in an endless spinning wheel of religion where you are trying this sacrifice and, well, let me sacrifice this. Well, maybe if I sacrifice this, God will be pleased. Maybe if I sacrifice that, I will be closer to God. That's just human beings trying to figure it out. But God is saying, listen, stop sacrificing all these things, killing stuff all around you, and let me put my laws in your heart so that instead of looking without, now it's coming from within. God says your bodies are now my temple and your heart is the holiest of holies. And so, and you won't have to worry about always trying to interpret or figure it out because I'm going to write it in your minds. From your minds will become the thoughts of God because you remember he said, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. And that's why to make your thoughts my thoughts, I'm going to have to write my law into your mind so that you be, you, the, the thoughts that are generated are thoughts that were put there by my spirit. Oh, somebody got to get happy with God because he puts it on the inside. You don't have to worry about, okay, how can I figure this out? It goes back to that old saying that grandma used to say, you don't have to figure it out. He already worked it out. And he worked it out by writing it on your heart and into your head so that wherever you are, that's where the answer is because it's an inside job. You don't have to worry about an external a mecca or an external tabernacle or external sanctuary that you have to go to find God. God says, I'm going to make my residence up here. Here is where this is going to be your greatest theological uh, 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 library. And for those of you who are just listening, I'm pointing at my heart right now and I'm pointing at my head. I'm going to put my 
all my, my uh, uh, theological books into your heart and into your mind. I'm going to put my concordances and my thesauruses, my dictionaries, my, my biblical, uh, uh, all my biblical writings I'm going to put within you so that you can begin to hear my voice wherever you are. I remember so many times when uh, back in the day before we had our cell phones where you can look things up, man, I always had to find my big old concordances and all these, I'll show you all these books right here. Oh my goodness, you have to look through that just to, to find a word and understand it. All these um, uh, anchor Bible dictionaries and Matthew Henry commentary, all these commentaries that I had to go through to get some understanding. And God says, that's great. I want you to study and I want you to read. However, where I want to write all what I'm trying to tell you is in your heart and in your mind, because that is going to have an impact on how you live your life. Because when you have a full assurance of faith, what does the Bible says is going to happen? First of all, it's going to uh, affect our profession of faith because you have a lot more confidence when you are living a life that is truly impacting your world. Because how many times when people say, yeah, I'm, I'm religious, but I don't really know all that. I mean, it's just what I believe, but you know, it's not really affecting how I live my life. You know, I just, that's what I was brought up in. You see, that's not a confidence where you can enter into the holiest of holies. You want a full assurance of your faith. And when God writes his laws in your hearts and your minds, it makes a difference. And what do we understand from the scriptures that law that he's going to write on your heart and mind is? It's the law of love, because did not Jesus say when the man said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I, I, I obey all the commandments. I, I obey the law and the prophets, but I just don't feel a change in my life. I just feel like I'm living a life of obedience and sacrifice. But I don't feel so. I know something is missing. I know it has to be more than that. And Jesus said this, listen, the law really boils down to two things. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Because you're trying to understand all these laws, all, all the hundreds of them, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of reading each law interpreting each law, trying to figure out how each law applies to you in your day-to-day -day life. And he says, if you can just get these two, you really get the essence of all of them. Love God with everything you got and love your neighbor, not as you want to, <laughs> but love them as you would want people to love you. If you can get those two things, everything else will come into place as far as your relationship and your walk with God. That gives you me much more assurance to handle two laws as opposed to 630 something, whatever, however many the laws is. And you know what religion does, keep adding on to the law book, amen? Every time you turn around, there's a new law. But he said, always focus on those two. Love God with all you got and love your neighbor as yourself. And how do we know that this is what God is having in mind here? Is look at verse 24, because I believe verse 24 in Hebrews chapter 10 is the bottom line. He said, let us consider one another. Some of your translations will say, let us provoke one another and stir up love and good works because at the end of the day that is what god is trying to be about when he said god is love that is who god is so 
after all this, instead of doing these sacrifices that are killing stuff or pushing stuff away in your life, he says, what I want you to be about is stirring up love among one another and good works. Because that's the change that God wants to see. God doesn't want you to have a, a relationship with a distant God who's supposed to be a love, but I don't see it. God says, I want to express my love first in you and then through you. Because you know that old saying, hurt people, hurt people? It's because that's what their hearts are full of, hurt and pain. So that's why they live life of hurt and pain and cause pain and hurt in other people. But God said, first of all, receive my love. And then all of a sudden you will be so full of love that it will begin to spill out into your life. People will start asking you, why are you so happy today? I don't know. You know, you'll have joy unspeakable and full of glory. You will have that peace that passes all understanding. You will have that, 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 that relationship with God that you are just so happy with that it just spills over into your smile and into your demeanor and into your interactions with one another. You will begin to perform good works because you just see things that you want to help. You see people who are suffering and you want to be a blessing to them. You will see someone in pain, you want to bring healing. It's these good works that will be incorporated into your day-to-day -day life that will truly be a reflection of who God is and God's agenda in this world so that we can be living the prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven because it's being done on earth through you who are reflections of the love of God. You are making God's love real. And love is something you can be sure of. Religion causes you to be full of doubt, full of confusion. But the love that God is trying to write in your mind and your heart, your mind, your thinking is based on love. So even when you don't understand somebody, your natural inclination, spiritually speaking, is to love them. Even when you don't agree with how they think, what they do, or how they live in their life, it's love is how you see them. No wonder if this is who Jesus is, it's true that even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us because that's how love is. Love doesn't say, as soon as you get your act together, then I will show you some love. Why, can you imagine if God waited for us to get our act together before he loved us, before he came here on earth and walked among us and died for our sins? Man, we still be waiting for the first coming, <laughs> nonetheless the second coming. But because God loved us, he began to see us in the way he wants to make us. And he began to treat us as saints, even while we were yet sinners, to the point where he commends his love for us. And that while we were still sinners, he died for us. And God says, that's the type of love that I want to operate daily in you, where you are loving people that are still sinful towards you. Because, yeah, God will give you the ability and the power to forgive. Peter said, how many times in a day can somebody sin against me and I forgive them? Seven times? I don't know about you, but seven times, that sounded mighty generous. Because I'll cut them off after one or two, if I'm being honest. But he said, no, 70 times seven carry the one, divide by three, 
And what? That many times in one day? Man, I don't, I don't forgive somebody that amount of times in my lifetime. Or I would have cut them off a long time ago. And God turns around and says, well, what if I did that to you? As many times as you sinned against me, what if I, if, is that the standard now? Because we can go back in time and that last time where you wanted to be saved and ask for forgiveness, I'll just say, no, sorry, son, I already cut you off. I'm sorry, son, your prayers have been blocked a long time ago. <laughs> God, we don't want a God who does that because that would not be an assurance of faith, would it? That would be a, an assurance of fear. I would be afraid. Is today the day I do the wrong thing or say the wrong thing where God is going to block me, cancel me, delete me? I don't have to worry about that because I have a better appreciation of the love of God. And that's why we are being perfected day by day. Because I don't know about you, but now that I know that that's the kind of God is, I can't leave him. I don't want to leave him. Ain't nothing better out there. Somebody said they searched the world over and found no one greater than our God. And that's how walking in that causes me to have a full assurance of faith. I just want to focus on you for a second. Where are you in this walk with God? Many of you have been like me, been living in uh, uh, living the church life for so long that you, you know, your emphasis is okay. I'll just sacrifice this, or I'll, I won't do this, or I won't do that, or. You know, you're always trying to figure out the right thing to give up or to sacrifice, and maybe that will make you feel closer to God. God said, listen, I already made a sacrifice for you over 2,000 years ago, Golgotha, that old rugged cross. A lot of people at that time lost their hope because in their minds, all they saw was a dead savior. But three days later, he rose again and is now seated at the right hand of God to say, there is nothing, not even death itself that can separate me from you. And there's nothing that you can do that can push me away can frustrate me, can anger me, just like any parent can be angry or frustrated with their child. But I still love you. And my goal is to draw you nearer and make you more and more the child of God that I envisioned for you. Maybe not even that you envisioned for yourself. You know what? I don't know about you. But that causes me to have a full and appreciated assurance of faith. If that's where you are today, just join us in just receiving the love of God. Even if you don't understand it, can you receive it and allow it to begin to writing its law in your mind and writing its law? on your heart so that you can live this thing day to day from the inside out and that love will rule your life and good works, the kind of works that God calls good can be a daily part of your life. That's my prayer for you. And I believe that's the will of God for today. Let us pray. Almighty God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for your love that surpasses all of our understanding and our appreciation. But God, we celebrate your love. This last week, we were celebrating our veterans, and I've heard so many people say to me, thank you for your service. Thank you for sacrificing 
to keep us safe. But God, each and every day, we ought to be saying to you, God, thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you, Lord. It is we who should be serving you, but it was you who was serving us, even to the point of washing our feet when we were scratching our heads saying, why are you serving us? Why are you washing our feet when we should be serving you? But you did that as an example that no matter how high we get, we can never be higher than you. And you put a towel around your shoulder, knelt down, and you got down at the foot washing level because you said that kind of love and that kind of service should be beneath none of us. If it wasn't beneath you, then good works like that can never be beneath us. So help us to remind us, uh, help us to remember your service in this world. Service driven and rooted in the love of God and help us to be day to day lovers of God and lovers of people. But that is the will of God for us in Christ Jesus, and that which will give us a full assurance of faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen and amen. Are you mad at this time? Are there any other announcements?